Welcome to Forensic Focus Podcast, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and anybody else who wishes to identify as anything else in between those variables. Um, Desi and I today just going to have a uh, nice catch up and a, uh, and a chat. We've got new toys to play with. We're uh, debating the uh, merits of not learning Java, and um, <laughs> and we're going to go from there and see how this pans out. Um, so uh, yeah, I I've been. I've been, my coding is, is, uh, interesting. My, my background, I learned C at university. Uh, actually I learned C and I learned prologue at university and the prologue has come in completely useless. Uh, C obviously is a really good programming language, but really low level. Um, I, then I moved on to Perl, which kind of, I mean, it still exists. It's still out there, obviously. You know, n- languages never die. They just become um, COBOL. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you get paid more for knowing them. Um, yeah. But uh, so Perl's still out there. And in fact, I, I, I do occasionally still write a script in Perl because I know how to do some things in it that I'm not sure I know how to do in anything else. Python seems like the logical successor to it. Um, but I was, I was looking... Python or, or Rust, I think. I've seen a lot of like Rust courses come out apparently because of like memory efficiency and stuff. So I, I guess it depends on, yeah. on what you're aiming for. But Python's one definitely my, flexible. One of my colleagues is is very pro Rust. Mm. Um, I think it's to do with the 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 ability to write secure code in it. Yeah, um, a lot of malware these days that's coming out that's that's been written in Rust as well. So like. From a defensive standpoint, learning it is beneficial. That's interesting, actually. I mean, Rust's compiled, isn't it? It's not an interpreted language. It's a mm-hmm. compiled language. Yeah. Pretty sure. Let me... So I'm um, not just lying. Let me look that up while you keep talking. The other one I was looking at um, is Swift. Now, I'm, I use Macs quite a lot. I, I tend to use them as Unix machines, given my background. Um, but Swift is the Apple open source programming language, and and that that so so for on the Macs that's quite good, and that comes with Xcode. Um, mm. But it's a long it's a it's a very long time since I did you know algorithms and um, big O and little O notation and uh, all of the good stuff like that. So uh, you know, looking looking on getting back into it and. Um, I was looking this morning, uh, and and you know it's one thing to spend time on on a course uh, or, or put money down on a course uh, to to learn, but you know it's always quite nice if if at the end of it you can come out with a skill set and a bit of paper. Um, and I was looking to see if there were any sort of degree modules or degree courses, um, master's level stuff maybe in something like software engineering or whatever. And I, I was sort of wandering around the web this morning. Um, and um, yeah, the amount of people that are teaching Java and uh, I, I, I've never had any desire to learn Java or JavaScript. Um, and I'm sure I've upset some programmers out there who are listening who think Java is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, I think it, it, it depends on your, your outcome, right? Like I was, I was doing like a, challenge investigation today like a little ctf thing and like java is heavily used in web applications so i guess it like languages are good for the purpose that they were generally built for designed for yeah yeah so like J- javascript's awesome if you're a web developer and and people usually people who you talk to and they they think javascript's like the best thing ever they're yeah. web developers like it, it's useful it can run things like Probably once you get used to it, which is probably something I'll never get used to, um, it's probably really easy to use and and people love it. But in terms of like automation uh, for security tasks that you would do, usually most people turn to Python, but that's because there's so many community built supported libraries out there that will do things that you need them to do. And that's like the community behind Python like Python wouldn't be as big without that, I don't think. And it, it took a huge risk as a language when it pretty much rewrote itself from Python 2 to Python 3. Like there's still tools out there that you need the old Python 2 to run it, but everything seems to be shifting to Python 3 and the community was really supportive of that as well. That was a that was a very interesting experience for me 
so I mean, I I am not a coder, but I can read half a dozen languages. It's because some somewhat like my um my my uh, human language skills is is that you know constructing a sentence in pretty much any other language for me is a very very painful process. Um, but I can actually read to a certain degree French and German, and then um, on mm. the basis of that, I can kind of make sense of Italian and um, and, and Spanish because they're all those that that European school of languages, uh, along with English, is is quite. Um, we bastardize everything, has, right? Yeah, exactly. So mm. <laughs> I, I was I was so always so disappointed, and this is this goes to show my age apart from anything else. When I when I learned French the first time round. Um, there was a, a skateboard was a planche à la roulette which is a plank on skate on, on wheels um and now it's le skateboard which i think is a terrible waste <laughs> of um and actually they've done the same with computer it used to be l'ordinateur um and now it apologies to anybody who has pronunciation skills i'm doing my very best i promise <laughs> um and is now le computer which is again a, a, a horrible degradation of 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 what is a quite a beautiful language there you go for for those of you i've just murdered the pronunciation of the language for i think <laughs> french is beautiful um so yeah. so there we go um but i guess we we were having a quick chat before this about like you were looking into university courses and um like about a year and a half ago i'd uh taken a, a udemy course on on python and that's like i'll chuck that in the show notes it's something that i'm still going but the the benefit of the course i found um like it, it comes from a learning institution like they have their own company but that that particular course is on udemy was that it's it's 100 days of coding which is like for those in programming and studying like that boot camp mentality is quite a well-known premise and the idea is i guess to give you a hands-on practical portfolio at the end of it and really good thing I found about this course was it provided that uh, the fill in in the skill set between here's, here's the beginner hello world in an if loop and here's this advanced project that we want you to do some automation in and actually filled in that gap for you to get your skills to that that final kind of capstone project where you're yeah. self-sufficient coding and, and doing your own thing. And that was that. That's that's kind of where I've always struggled, actually. So I'm really excited by by this course um, because I mean, I, I like I say, I learned C, so I could I could mm. program and say I could do if loops, while loops, conditionals, cases, um, you know, all of the pointer arithmetic, all of that stuff. I learned it all. And then there's like, okay, so I know a language, and here's Unix that's written in C. How do I go from here to yeah. here? And you know that's that's currently where my programming level is at. You know, I can yeah. string together a simple procedural functional program that will take an input and give me an output, having processed it in the middle. Mm. Ask me to do anything which has uh, any form of user interface or any form of um, you know sort of variable fun variable functionality within it. So, you know, conditional yeah. functionality beyond, you know, this is the input, this is the output. I'm pretty, pretty useless. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, again, I was a sysadmin. I, I wrote a bunch of scripts that when I, you know, I, I bash scripts and things like that, that, you know, you run cron jobs, that you do this, you do that. And, and it's, it's actually quite a lot of the way that I still do um, forensic cases to a certain extent is, is that I use grep, <laughs> um, said orc the yep. command line tools for for munging and manipulating data you know head tail first yeah. last yeah. um and and i rip stuff apart that way so but even even then it's 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 still very procedural it's like this input this input this input yeah it's daisy chained into a longer thing so the idea and and um desi said that uh he's halfway through the um the the course uh and, and it's 100 it really is 100 days yeah, hundred uh, projects suspension. as well. 100, so, 100, yeah, um, but he he said he's on a, a what was it intermediate plus, and I found I think the intermediate plus project that he's getting stuck on, which is the uh, automatic swipe right on. Um, I've lost it now. It was day fifty. There it is. Uh, intermediate auto auto Tinder swiping bot in in yeah, Python. Yeah, 
Um, I just I couldn't get past of like mounting the phone with a glove on a fan to just do it for me. Like <laughs> I was like, I really like the practical applications rather than programmatical. So um, yeah, I kind of like stopped there. Um, but um, I guess but like actually, oh sorry, actually from a forensic perspective, you know, this is this this middle section is actually really good because it's talking yeah. about uh, the web scraping stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Some really into- extensible projects that you can yeah, yeah. use Twitter in your and job. Instagram and web mm-hmm. scraping, data entry things. So yeah, there's there's a lot in here that's um, that's really good. And actually, you know, again, not we're, we're we're not on commission for this one. We we need to figure out our sponsorship. You know, Nord <laughs> VPN. Um, yeah, we'll we'll promote Udemy if they want to. Like, <laughs> um, but you know, for for a hundred days worth of stuff, and you, you're already halfway through it. Or, or, yeah. or thereabouts and you're saying it's good so you know I've got yeah it, but, but, but for 18 pounds uh, that's that's insane you know yeah um, yeah and so, it's so, you know it's one of those like like learning a high level language like you said with the bash scripting stuff like there's you can get really advanced but it becomes very complex with stringing multiple things together whereas mm. when you want to like run things in parallel or or do some complex tasks with these larger programming languages it is like learning a language. Like you can learn how to sh- construct a sentence, but if you don't have a dictionary of words behind you, you're very limited in what you can say. And I, yes, yeah. like programming is the same. Like it's not so much that the language or the structure of it's hard if you're a logical thinker. The struggle is you just don't know what kind of libraries and packages exist out there until you get into it. And, I, and that's what this kind of course and the boot camp courses do is they just introduce you to a new library and they're like, here's this library and here's what it does and here's all these features that it can give you. And it takes you a while. Like if you're, if you don't have a, a big programming background, it takes you a while to pick up a new language and go and read the documentation and understand what different libraries are doing. So having yeah. like, this is why one-on-one courses and, and going to do a bachelor's degree in computer science is really good. Cause that, that's what they teach you, right? Like, I think yeah, yeah, you start in today's, from scratch. Yeah, you start yeah. from scratch. Yeah. I, I just think in today's day and age, like the industry market for learning is so good at the moment. Like where we are living in such good times to get such great education for such for not for not paying that much money. Yeah, yeah. As long as you've got the intrinsic drive to do it, I think that's the biggest thing. Cause because uni forces you to do it, right? Like you're it's it's like your job yes. and you're there. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you like, I own like twenty courses that I haven't finished. Like case in point, only, is only one. twenty. <laughs> oh mate, I have, I have so many just like sitting in the wings that I I, I don't even want to talk about how much money I've spent on on stuff. That it's like the, a Steam, it's like a Steam game library. Like you see you see a sale and you're like, oh yeah yeah, I'm like, gonna play yeah. that game. I'm gonna yeah. buy it for like five bucks and play it, and then. Like I have like a hundred games that I haven't played just because I got them for free or for five bucks. Yeah. The same thing with courses for me. It's it's terrible. It was one of my New Year's resolutions to finish courses. And I, I just bought more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to say I, there there are two two other. And again, we're not we're not sponsored in any way. There are two other ones that I've come across that I have rated. One is something called Masterclass. Mm. Um. And you actually, I can share the screen. So let me, um, especially when they give out free, like single master plot classes, that's something that you're interested in. I always love jumping on those. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, the master master class site and, and the people who they're pulling in, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I had a subscription for a couple of years and, and, um, I wasn't using it enough, so I've canceled it, but fundamentally, um, you know, you can go and learn there's not there's not a huge amount of tech stuff in there it, for, in terms of what we do um yeah. there's not a, not a huge amount of tech stuff in there full stop but there's there's um but there's I like they, it's it's all right even in today's age right like when we're paying like i've got three subscription services if i got rid of one yeah like masterclass or yeah. like get get something that you're interested in to to yeah. learn like darknet diaries like i support that yeah that podcast because I learn a lot from it and I think the content that, that Jack does yeah. is really good. Um, 
Yeah, but I mean, if you, if, for example, cooking, cooking, they have a fairly, uh, yeah. a, a fairly extensive thing. But they have, you know, Gordon Rams is on there teaching cooking. Uh, Thomas Keller, uh, Wolfgang Puck. You know, there, there's there's really big um, names. Yotam uh, Ottolenghi is one of you know fantastic chef uh, in the UK. Actually, his restaurant's really good as well. Um, so you know, if you want to try any of those, they've got. But it's it's the writing and. Um, uh, acting classes that they have that are phenomenal. So you've got, I mean, mm. I'm going to say Dan Brown, I wouldn't necessarily suggest as a particularly good author, successful, massively successful, terrible writer. Um, I, I, I can say, I, I, I <laughs> again, Dan Brown fans out there. I'm sorry, Dan yourself. I'm, 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 I'm hugely in awe of what you've achieved, but um, I used to read a lot of Dan Brown and I picked it up in the airport I would read it on a plane where concentration levels required are absolutely nothing. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the attention levels are, 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 are low and I could read at my pace and it was fine. I used to really enjoy Dan Brown. I got a new audio book and I started listening to it in the car and because I couldn't skip paragraphs and I had to pay attention to it, it drove me around the bend. It was so badly written. Um, anyway, I'm massively digressing from it. The other one that's really good is actually called Domestica. I don't know if you've come across that one. Right. Mostly those aren't in uh, English necessarily as the first language. A few of them are. Uh, a lot of them are in Spanish or, or actually a lot of them are in Spanish because it's a Spanish company, I believe. Um, but they have all sorts of things um, on the creative side. Again, they do have a. There was an introduction to Java script, Java script programming, um, and a few other technical ones. But they also have uh, introductions to Photoshop and some of the other um, sort of artistic um, applications. So I'll, we'll put a link into that as oh, well. Oh yeah, um, actually, I have seen I've seen Domestica before, and I I I find this as the thing as well, like. If you've got zero money as to to spend on these kind of courses, usually you can find stuff that might not be as polished, but you can find stuff for free. Because I was looking at a um, an artistic course. I, I got myself um, like an, an iPad to travel with work because oh yeah, like we can use those devices with our company stuff. Um, and iPads are really good for kind of the art drawing apps because I got the pen with it as well. And I was like, oh, I should learn how to. Like I, I used to love drawing um, and I was like, oh, I should do do some drawing courses. So Domestica was one of the ones that I saw. Um, there's also like Apple loves their subscription apps because yeah. they get a 30% cut of everything anyway. Um, but as I was researching all this, I found like uh, Reddit subgroups that were like people were posting just like videos on how to do things that you would learn in these kind of courses anyway. And there was like, a few really well-known users within those subgroups that if you just followed their user channel, they would post like daily, just like, here's a little tip art thing. And like, as I was doing that, I was like getting, getting better and better at, at doing some of the art stuff, but that was completely free. And, and YouTube, I guess, is another yeah. like, example say, of that. That's a great resource. On, on YouTube, uh, if you go along to uh, the MIT, it's MIT OCW, so MIT Open Courseware, uh, they have uh, a section on computer science, um, which includes some fantastic stuff. I mean, I, I've I've actually recommended, well, actually, funnily enough, the um, oper the computer operating systems course that they do, mm -hmm. uh, because it's based on the same book as I use or we were using at Warwick um, to teach the operating systems course. There was actually a lot of crossover between what their lecturers are saying online in um in the open courseware stuff and what we were saying in the classroom to students it's 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 a very uh very very realistic uh representation of a a degree level uh, first year undergraduate degree level course in operating systems for me and i'm just looking at it now they've got uh in the computer science section uh, algorithms there's an introduction to computer science and programming which i think is going to do python there's ai in there Mm -hmm. um computer system security uh, i mean some of these they're, they're old to a certain extent i mean the, the computer system security one dates from 2014 but fundamentally the principles of computer system yeah. security haven't significantly changed in the last mm -hmm. seven years no 2014 10 years nine years 
time flies when you're locked up in a pandemic. Um, and doing math is hard. Doing math is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yes, so the MIT open courseware is good. I'm not sure. I, I think, I think I, my experience of online forensics conversations has not necessarily been as positive uh, on online forensics training has not necessarily been as positive as, I mean, obviously MIT is a, a huge institution that has a lot of backing. Mm. Um, I have seen, I have seen, so, I've seen a few forensics courses paid for. Uh, I got, I was asked to review one. Somebody, somebody wrote to me and went, would you review this course? And they, they then promptly had an argument with me about whether they were actually going to give me access to the course or not. Um, and then they gave me access to the course and I pulled out three errors in the first lesson and suggested that perhaps they didn't really want me to write an honest review yeah. of this because I thought it was shit. Um, so, you know, it, I think, there, there is definitely quality issues out there. I think forensics is hard because it's like you can, you can go and look up the basic principles of forensics or digital forensics on Wikipedia and they, and everyone agrees with them, right? Like yeah. you kind of have chain of custody, like you hash your evidence at the start, you handle everything with care, you need to be able to explain it. Like every forensics course I've ever done, that's like 101 right in the first one to three lessons. Where it gets tricky, and because I was recently doing a kind of like forensics course and just like an intro to um, like working in a SOC kind of thing, is that it's so contextual, like... I mm. are, are you doing financial fraud forensics where you're you're tracking business email compromise or are you working on mobile phone forensics for like federal police and those two things are, are vastly different and the technical skills are vastly different in both those things because one of them is like email forensics in the sense of like a corporate entity and then one is mobile phone forensics, which is then super varied depending on which mobile device you have. And usually you have access to really expensive tools that does the collection for you. And then usually puts it into, like analysts will still need to understand what's happening, but it puts it into a nice format for analysts yeah. to then review it on, in, in bulk. So I think that's, that's why it's so hard to get something that's good and teaches the forensics mindset. And I think we've spoken about this before, but that just kind of comes with experience. It's yeah. very hard, to, hard to teach that. I think, I think what one of the issues with forensics is that it's seen and, and not wrongly so, but it's seen as a technical skill. There's a mm. huge amount of technical skill in it, but actually the investigative mindset and the fundamental logical understandings that are required in order to get to and and there's a fair degree of writing skill involved as well when you're reporting mm. i mean we've talked about this or probably online but certainly I think, most, I think it was mostly this week we we're discussing report writing and yeah, yeah. and most courses um, teach it and, and you know the amount of times i've got my head in my hands at the the spelling mistakes and the grammatical errors and the mm. and you know, to my mind, I'm dyslexic. I, I, I have to run everything through a spell checker and, you know, I, I do that <laughs> because I think it's unacceptable at the level that we're operating at to, to put out a report with spelling mm. mistakes in it. To see stuff coming to me that is riddled with spelling mistakes, logical fallacies are terrible. I, I, it's one of the lessons I give to my students is there's a, there's a couple of fantastic sites. I'll link to one later on logical fallacies. Um, because you know x all x equals y is not the same as all y equals x you know there there are there are some very important simple mm. chains that you've got to understand mm -hmm. um so i think i think the trouble with a lot of the technical stuff that you see online is it's that they don't address uh the soft skills and the hard logical skills that are required around uh, forensics as opposed to just oh yeah here's an artifact you know how did it get there well okay that's one way it could have gotten there how wh what about other ways are you going to consider other scientific potential 
uh, operations? What's your hypothesis? What's your scientific method? Like you were saying, you know, what's the what's the methodology that you're working mm. with to get to this scientific conclusion? Um, and I, again, you know, I'm not. I, I've been off Twitter for a few days because it was just driving me around the bloody bend. But there was a guy on there who was. Um, He's, he's upset a hell of a lot of the security industry for various assorted reasons. I'm not going to name him because everybody who's listening to this who knows him knows who, he, who I'm talking about. Um, but he was like, oh, you know, there's no probability in forensics. I was like, sorry, what? Yeah, it's th- there's there's a higher probability that this evidence may have gotten there from one way or another, but it's not, you know, for anything that could have two explanations as to how that data got there. You know, and and one of those explanations is always somebody with a great deal of skill came along and planted that evidence. Now, the probability mm-hmm. of that may be very, 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 very negligibly low. But to say that there's no probability is a fundamentally wrong statement. Yeah. So, you know, he, but, but, you know, as opposed to going, yeah, I see what you're talking about. This guy's doubled down on it. And as, as anyway, he's upset a lot of people, but that's the thing is, is that, you know, there's, there's more to it than this solid technical background. Yeah. Um, and that's not what we're, not what I find available on, um, or online because yeah. of the, 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 the technical focus. And I think yeah. it's more important in forensics than necessarily in other areas. Yeah, and um, and I agree with that. Like the the course that I was recently doing had a a certification component at the end, and they kind of skipped over. Like they they talked about report writing, and then right at the end, they're like, "Oh, while you're doing the assessment, like make sure you you create a timeline." But they didn't really discuss the importance of the the timeline and and why you have it. And it it's not just because you're tracking evidence through a system and and understanding how it goes. Is the timeline gives you a visual visualization of what the person on the other end was doing. Cause if you see events happening and there's either too short of time between them or one happens before the other, you, like you need to visualize what that person was doing at the keyboard because a human is only capable of doing stuff so fast. So if yeah. something is really quick, then potentially that was a script and it was automated. And then you need to have the evidence to say that. Yeah. But if it's, if it's not, and it's in the user space of, kind of artifacts then you need to explain why it happens so quickly and you might like a lot of the times you find stuff and it goes into your like investigative timeline where you're you know you know that it's connected because it's linked with the say the user account that you're tracking but you can't conclusively say why it was there and then when you're presenting your report at the end and and like i generally don't deal in digital forensics i deal in instant response which doesn't have to go to a a court of law yeah, yeah but i can only present the facts as i know them to be absolutely true yeah. so i can't i can't present a timeline that has all these entries in it and then someone go oh what was this and i'm just like oh, i don't know but it was a, it was attached to this user account i have to go well this user was in this box at this time they opened this file like i'm only presenting the facts that i exactly know what that person was basically yeah. doing yeah. Um, cause otherwise it muddies the waters and that's another communication piece, right? Like if I'm presenting all this technical evidence, the lay person who doesn't know what the artifacts are, well, that'll just confuse them and it won't get the actual point across. Yeah. I, I've got a case I'm working on at the moment and, uh, I, I, I've actually gone out and bought timelining software. I'll, I'll put a link into what it, what it is that I bought. I, I'm not in any way promoting this again and in fact i'm not even recommending this it just happens to be the one that i found that i think looks the best i haven't even used it properly yet but it, it's i bought it anyway it was not that expensive so it's um it, it's there but this this case it, it involves a laptop um and it's a very very historical case it's windows xp it dates back to 2007 or something but the thing is is that the laptop uh, had been left in, left in the storage for a long time, was taken out and then was turned on. But of course, all of the BIOS batteries had died or, and it, it's gone completely flat. So there's a whole bunch of activity that appears to have happened sometime in 2005 when the BIOS battery basically reset back to whatever its default state was. And trying to figure out what activity has happened 
recently from a rebooted machine that now thinks it exists before the before the original installation of the Windows operating system on it is I oh, it's a nightmare. It really is. Um, That's I'm getting 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 some fairly long lists of files that you know file times uh, to yeah. trying to trying to reconstruct a a vague guess at when something may have actually really happened versus uh, when you know what it says it it is. It would be like, super, it's, super interesting to look at the MFT of that and see it happen because that like never happens is when it's yeah, resetting yeah. its own time. Yeah, and then it wasn't connected. It didn't sort of automatically connect to a network. It didn't do any, any yeah. of those things. It was just literally turned on, and then somebody yeah. used it for a bit. So you'd have files existing before the MFT was created. Yeah. Or like, right, you'd have like the MFT <laughs> created and then that, and then you'd have like some other system stuff happening. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, um, I'm, I'm about two days into it. I mean, it's just been setting up and indexing it. Yeah. More, but I, I can already see that this is going to be. Um, but then, you know, it, it, this is great. And I'm going to, pres- I'll, I'll come up with a, a working, hopefully a working concept of how it's all done. And then I have to present that, you know, yeah. I've got to explain to someone that, okay, these files that have this date probably happened over here somewhere. Um, in, <laughs> in, 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 you know, they didn't, or at least, you know, somebody says that this is what has happened. And therefore yeah. I have no reason to doubt because they sure as hell weren't created before the, before the laptop was manufactured. Um, so, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be quite entertaining. Um, but again, you know, you're talking, I I don't know what the outcome of it will be yet as to, to, to to the other evidence in there, Mm. but this sort of stuff just introduces reasonable doubt before you even start, you know, it's like, Mm. if you can't tell when a file is created, you know, so this is really where it's going to come down to. Like, yeah, in in all probability, this is what has happened. I can't, I can't, I wasn't there. I haven't had my eyes on this laptop for the duration of its life. You yeah. know, I can't honestly tell you 100% that this is the case, but this is what I honestly believe is the probable chain of events. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it's all good. So, so I'm going to learn Python then, I think. Yeah, the out- good outcome of language. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Udemy's, Udemy's a good platform. It has some, like, don't get me wrong. I've done some shit courses that I've paid $10 for on, on Udemy before, but because um, I guess it, it's just a a delivery platform. So I've got a vague comes... feeling I must have an account on it, actually, because I, uh, let's see if I can remember what it is. Yeah, but it, it comes down to the content delivery people who are doing it, I guess, so... Um, but the other thing that we wanted to talk about, which has been in the news a lot, is I guess. Um, oh shit! I do have and, an account. <laughs> and because I actually got mine, my my little flipper, which is now banned yeah. in uh, US, is it banned in the US and it's somewhere else? banned in a few places. They are. Uh, hang on, let me have a look. I was. <laughs> we've been bouncing the links backwards and forwards. Uh, yeah, it, it was funny because like I was, I've been waiting for mine to come for ages because it, I had um had to set up a little like visual ping thing to tell me when it was back in stock because they always sell out really quick. And then. Uh, So Amazon, Amazon has banned the sale of it on through Amazon um, because it is a hacking device, allegedly. Well, so that's, that's only in, that's only in some countries because I got mine from Amazon, like while the ban was happening. Uh, I think, I think it's still country specific, uh, and in Australia, it's not. Um, but it was it was interesting because we were throwing the links back and forth, and I watched um, like a, a YouTube video kind of covering it, and they covered the fact that like they showed that all the functionalities that you have in this thing, you can still buy on Amazon in those countries, or you can make yourself because the chips have been available since like two thousand and seven, yeah. um, or you could also buy from for slightly more money. Uh, more capability that is potentially illegal, um, mm. but they sell it as like a, a research device, I guess. Um, and the I guess the end point was that it was so versatile having this because, like, even though it's not super powerful, you can do a lot with it. And you can buy like 
um, I bought like the dev board with the Wi-Fi in it and that. Ah, oh, good. I was I was looking at that the other day. Mm. I didn't I didn't buy one because I actually did it on the original Kickstarter campaign. Ah, uh, yeah, through that. Yep. And the dev board didn't exist back then to order. Mm. I've seen so people. Mindset. I've seen people just like plug in because it's just got like the the I/O pins in the top. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've seen people just plug this into like breadboards with stuff that mm. they've made with chips from like I don't know what you guys have over there, but like J Car is like an electronic store over here. Yeah, we used to we used to have a company called Maplin, but they don't do it anymore. RS Electronics is the, the oh, online yeah. uh, the online site that. that yeah, yeah, yeah. I I tend to buy. Uh, not flipper stuff, but uh, there, there's two companies. One's called the Pie Hut, and the other one's Pie oh, yeah. Moroni. Again, links in the show notes. But they're the they're the UK suppliers for all sort of pie Arduino, single board computer, experimental mm. kind of things. Yeah. Um. So I tend to buy my stuff from them. Um, yeah, I recently bought. I, I feel the Australian. I'll put the Australian one in the link notes as well. But in the show notes. Uh, but I bought the one that's the keyboard that they've just stuffed a uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Raspberry yeah. Pi in the keyboard. And I like, because I've got my home gym, I have a TV in there and I use that to put my programming up on. But it was yeah, such yeah. A, a space saver to just have like a, a easy, small computer that has Wi Fi. Because I also stream like YouTube in there to listen to music. Yeah. And it was like, it was so good because it was keyboard, comes with a USB C mouse that you plug into it, and then you just run the HDMI to the, the TV. Yeah. So. Like, I could have it's, made it, it cheaper, it, but I didn't have it to. It really is the spiritual successor to the, the old sort of BBC Micro, which is what it was intending to be, which was a, mm. you know, a single device that you just plugged into your telly and then got on with it. Yeah. Um, is there this, are you guys having the same supply issues that we are? We can't get a Raspberry Pi 4 for love nor money here. Yeah, it took, I think that one I ordered and it was on back order for a while. Um and then they must have just had a restock. But the the keyboard doesn't have the latest version of the Pi in it, so it was a little bit easier uh, to get, okay. I think. Um, yeah, I've got I've got uh, I've got one Raspberry Pi four, um, which is it's actually running um, well Pi Hole for a start. If you haven't come across Pi Hole. Um, that is definitely worth learning about. Um, and the other thing, oh, I've got it running a WireGuard VPN as well um, for, for dialing back into the house uh, when I'm out. Um, so, yeah, no, they're, they're fantastic little bits. And the the um, the Raspberry Pi is so powerful now, the 4. It's absolutely nice. Oh, you, see, you see some of the, like, homebrew projects on YouTube where they're, like, putting them in parallel to do like crypto mining and stuff. And yeah, it's absolutely not. And then people are 3d printing like containers for them as well. Yeah. looks so cool. Something, something that I'd say I'd do and I'd put it on my project list and I'd never get done. Have you got a 3d printer? No, uh... it's on my buy list for projects, but I know if I get it, I'm just going to like do like two projects and then it'll sit there. Yeah. That's pretty much what happened to mine. Um, so, so that's fair. Uh, but I it, need to it, finish all the courses that I've bought for SI before I yeah. jump on the bandwagon of building things. I was like, um, so I, 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 I've, I printed that know, half a dozen little stupid things, like a little Totoro model for my daughter. The oh, um, yeah. from 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 the um, animation, um, and then I was chatting to my neighbour months ago, and he uh, he needed a replacement piece for his shower door um and he was like oh, i can't find one anywhere i'm gonna have to you know s- knock one he's a, he's an engineer um in aerospace um mm. a physical engineer the mechanic engineer type as opposed to um designing um so he's very 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 good with engines and all sorts of things and i was he was so he was hand manufacturing this thing i said oh do you want to do you want to borrow this and he sort of took it away i gave him a little sort of how-to card on Tinkercad or whatever the hell it was that I, I recommended. He went away, knocked up half a dozen shower screen uh, adapters and printed them out, and he's had more functional use out of it than I have. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> um, should have leased it are. out. That was your issue. Yeah. Good, that was my could issue, have made a actually. side business. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm always super amazed at people who take, like, 
real parts and turn them into CAD drawings and then are, are able to design these things. Yeah. Like it's, it's a real skill to have. And it's something that I didn't, cause I, I did partly mechanical when I was at uni, we had to do CAD projects. I used to hate it because you're at uni. This was before I had like a decent computer at home. So using AutoCAD on uni computers was like, yeah. you'd, op you'd open the program. You wouldn't even have anything in it. It'd be like half an hour to load. Yeah. So your two hour shoot would go by pretty quick, but yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed at watching people put stuff together and then print it out yeah. and make their little projects. It's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, he, he had a way, way better time than I did of, <laughs> of, of doing it. So um... yeah. But yeah, you no, know, I mean, people, people knock out all sorts of stuff for the, the Raspberry Pi. I mean, they're amazing little bits of kit with all of those headers and like the headers on the, um, in fact, on the on the uh, flipper are you know pretty much identical. They're, they're, they're numbered. Uh, yeah, you can write the code for them. Well, they're um, numbered and they've got their like their values next to them printed. Yeah. Um, and I'll show you the the little Wi-Fi board. I'll put it in. It takes up all the headers. Plug it in. Have you flashed? I mean, I I plug mine in and then I I hadn't I hadn't used it for ages. Actually, I hadn't used it. Full stop. Oh wow. Yeah, it's pretty big. Um, I, I basically I got it. I turned it on. I took a look at it when it arrived, and mm. then I put it in the project shelf. <laughs> and there it stayed. Um, that's, yeah, and, that's and because we started, we started talking about it. I pulled it out and um, and went to the to the manuals and stuff now uh, that are available. And it was like connect to it using this, connect to it using that, and it's like the uh, firmware on this is so old that it wouldn't talk to anything. Um, I ended up doing a full basic reset and uh, reflash of the of the firmware. So mine's now currently the latest official firmware, but there are alternate firmwares I've found <laughs> out that that open up some of the um, some some more functionality. One of which is actually the the radio stuff because in the UK, yes, you're limited. You you tell it where you are. And then mm. it, it limits your radio frequencies to that set, whereas the um, the I don't know how to say, the other firmware will open its full range, so you can actually do more more scanning than um, than than you would be able to otherwise. Um, mm. So I might I might investigate that a bit further, but it, it's um, it's neat. I was. I was, <laughs> I was trying to get the cat to sit still long enough so I could scan the chip in the back of her neck. But she oh yeah, because it does. She, yeah, it's it meant does to do that as well. As, as long as have, as long as the chips of a certain type. Yeah. Otherwise, it only gives you the serial number, I think. Well, there's two. There's there's a couple of bits of information apparently that it can do. One is temperature. I had no idea that it actually monitored the temperature of my cat. Um, but yeah, there's a serial number. But then it it links back to the, um the various websites that you can use to look it up um oh yeah 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 so, so on, yeah you can, where you are yeah yeah so i was gonna i was gonna just double check to to make sure that the um the vet's information was all was all up to date but i i like i say i couldn't get the cat to sit still long enough while i rubbed this device over the back of her neck so um uh, another time oh there we go i can't can't use it because apparently I need an SD card. I just turned it on and went through the like little intro menu, but yeah. it tells me that uh, you dial the cyber dolphin is happy and is on level one, and then it tells me that I need an SD card, which I don't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little micro SD. I put I, mine's got a micro SD in it now as well. You know, the um, real reason I bought this was that I I saw that it runs Doom, <laughs> which is like. Everything, everything the runs tech, Doom. Yeah, the tech nerds kind of, you don't buy a, a piece of equipment unless you think that it's going to be, potentially be able to run Doom. My my favorite which was, one, which I think, I, I'm pretty sure must be a spoof, um, but was Doom running on a pregnancy test? Did you see that one? Oh, maybe. I think I might have seen a picture. <laughs> And it was just like technology these days or something. Yeah, it was. Uh... Which is which is really hilarious because like, like I didn't grow up playing Doom. I I used to play um, Wolfenstein 3D, so which, oh, which yeah. I think was released just after that original Doom. Um, maybe it was, I don't know. I'll put the links for those that 
which no, 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 no. Doom, Doom is the is, is after Wolfenstein 3D was the first. Here, you go, here we go. Video games um, history lessons uh, one hundred and one. No, Wolfenstein 3D was basically the the start of the first person shooter era. Well, was um, I did watch a history video. I'll have to dig it up again, but it was the first one with major appeal. But there were unsuccessful ones before it, and those companies now. I think one of them turned turned into what Bungie is today. Yeah, yeah. Um, and another one turned into uh, potentially the precursor to Bethesda. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But no, it's. it's um, I mean, I remember. I remember playing a three D maze game. Mm. Um. But you know, you just it, it was kind of like the old um uh sort of adventure games where basically you could go north, you could go not you, you could go to, you know, polar coordinates, but not yeah. there was no free movement within that. So you went around the maze, but yeah, and that had 3D graphics. But um, yeah. I think the big thing with Wolfenstein was the fact that it rendered on the fly and it had texture, which games before that didn't have. Which I think gave it more of a three D feel than mm, the mm. prior games to it, because walls were very like they tried to give perspective, but it was essentially the lines that you're looking at. Whereas yeah, yeah, Wolfenstein was, was very textured, and they could kind of shade the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Doom gave you th- uh, true three dimensional play because it, Wolfenstein, you still stayed on the same level. You're moving. Mm horizontally in the x and y axis but you weren't there was no z axis to to work with whereas doom gave you the z axis as well yeah um yeah no i mean it's all great great good stuff i remember all of that um which is funny because i mean we had three dimensional flight sims prior to that so three dimensional movement was a was a fairly um a fairly well understood thing i mean from elite um on but then uh wing commander was the, the sort of the first one that i really remember playing mm. significantly um 3d movement but yeah doom I, I, I doom has been made to run on anything and everything i think my again one of my favorite hacks was actually somebody figured out how to run doom in doom <laughs> uh i saw someone uh Again, like I don't know how true these things are, but I thought I saw someone run Doom on a fridge, which I thought was uh, yeah. Funny. That, oh, to be honest, having seen some of the specs of the hardware on fridges, that does not surprise me. Oh, here we, yeah, um, here we go. The these are all be in the show notes for people that want to like check out our ranting at this point. Yeah. What Doom can run on? Maybe we'll just find like a YouTube video that covers all things that Doom can run on. Yeah, um, I've seen it running on printers. Uh, that was that was one of the earlier ones. Was to have it running on the little little uh, screens on printers. But yeah, um, but yeah, Doom Amazing. in Doom is 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 hilarious. Uh, we digressed massively from what we were talking about, but no, <laughs> yeah, this they're... is what happens. You sign up to a tech podcast. There you go. Yeah, episode started out really well, and then <laughs> just found another one. Doom running on a graphics calculator. Oh wow, that's cool. Doom running on a calculator powered by old potatoes. That's like next level <laughs> in graphic Oh, uh, I like, can say um, I feel like Doom running on something is like when you look up your your Florida birthday news story, it's just entertaining. Like no matter yes. yeah. what you kind of search, like either one is going to be super entertaining. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I'm gonna say there's a couple of couple of things actually. Um, one, while well, well, we're in the game space, just because we're there, um, have you seen the um, GoldenEye documentary? No. Right on okay. like the game. On the game, yeah. Uh, GoldenEye documentary, yeah. Golden Era. 2022 um that is that is excellent that is really really interesting 
Um, I, I can say, I've now watched Tetris, the movie, which I know you have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to I avoid mean, purely because of I'll, the... Um... I'll watch it. It's just Reddit advertisements have ruined it for me at this stage. I need to wait yeah. for it to die down. It was it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, yeah. What was the other one? Oh, yeah. Uh, this was recommended to me on Twitter before I... Um, before I dropped off, um, which we will debate whether I go back to or not. Um, yeah, I've been used Twitter. I've been used Twitter for a long time. I submitted a a call for speakers to a conference, and they were like, "What's your Twitter handle?" And I was like, I'm "Not putting that. I don't even use it anymore." Yeah, um, but this beam. racing the beam. Yeah, so this is about um, programming the original Atari video system oh, yeah. this is a, this is a pretty technical book but it's talking about how they coded the um and in assembly basically to use the because it was still on the cathode ray tube um it was hard to do work when you were trying to draw the screen but there's a period of time between the bottom right hand corner and the top left hand corner while the laser bit the laser beam the um, photon beam is moved back up to the top. Yeah. Um, so that's what they're talking about is racing the beam is trying to get as much programming into that section as possible. And, and then sort of using the overscan spaces and stuff to, to get, because okay. they need the processor to write to the screen and all the time they're writing to the screen, they can't be doing game calculations. Yeah. So they're fitting everything around, um, around that. And that got me sort of drifting off. I got this, I say this new book arrived this morning. This book arrived this morning. <laughs> um, so uh, the original sort of Z80 yeah. or an original Z80 programming language um, assembly uh, assembly book. Um, but it's like, you know, the, it's just fascinating. I'm, I'm so in awe of the people who did these um, amazing things with so little... Um, so little memory and and processor power yeah. and and because um, oh, this is kind of the start like so i did mechatronics which was programming on really memory limited um like yeah. eprom and that kind of stuff on memory limited um microcontrollers i'll try it there, there is a few online courses um there's also an assembly challenge course i'll find the notes and we'll chuck those in the show links but oh cool if you are interested like if people are interested in in learning like what these people were struggling with, like even just trying to do basic things like multiplication on eight bit processors is insanely hard. Cause it's not as like, we take it for granted that we open our calculator app and we can multiply yeah. two numbers together back then. Sometimes like I remember when I was first starting it was so limited that you're just like, Oh, you'll just run it through a loop for the amount of times that you want to multiply the number by. But even that you run out of space quite quickly. Cause you've, yeah. you've got to think, each time you're running through the loop, you've got to store that value that's getting bigger somewhere in memory that you just don't have. Yeah. I'm going to say it's that and um, division. Division is a yeah, nightmare. Division, yeah, division um, is way more complicated than you think it is when you first start, that's for sure. Uh, that's. I'm going to say that's another one. If you haven't seen it, you have Netflix, don't you? Yes. Okay. Because uh, this was, uh, hopefully it still is, um, it's called High Score and it works through uh, various assorted um, different video games. Um, oh, I think I started watching this, but I, I don't think I finished it. It does like, yes, I wa I've definitely watched episode two, which is about Nintendo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, that's... Uh, that, that that I found quite quite fascinating. Mm. Um, yeah, so so there's this there's, there's, there's a lot of fun to be had from um, from the video game stuff because again, you know, we're we're where pornography pushed the advent of um, uh, you know VHS and um, home home cinema and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Video gaming has massively pushed. Uh, the boundaries and it's particularly now when you look at the graphics cards that are now used for crypto mining or um 
the the massively parallel processes that are used for the um machine learning kind of stuff all of this started off because nvidia wanted to make a quick buck out of um people wanting to play games faster um so it yeah. is it, it, it does come round to us and i can say that's another piece of program <laughs> looping back to the beginning it's another piece of programming that i have never managed to grasp is i can do one thing linearly how the heck do you decompose a problem so that it works across 50 100 150 processes to do something yeah um and i say this you know my first job i worked in a not quite my first job my second job that was in computing as opposed to selling sandwiches the job that i have had previously um uh was working for a company that did computational fluid dynamics so was modeling the movement of fluids and stuff through systems and they were decomposing these problems to run across multi-processor systems and they would it's always the boundary issues because what they would do is they break it down so that each segment or each area was covered by a single processor but then it's how do you get all of those sort of edge cases to match together and line up and pass data backwards and forwards across um so ironically i'm i I, probably not anymore but i used to be quite good at setting up um all of the back-end unix systems for communicating multi-processor systems how to program one? Well, I haven't got a clue, but you know, <laughs> set one up. I can, I can do it. That, that that wasn't a problem. Building massive, um, what we call Beowulf clusters on Linux. So um, basically, commodity, just hardware, but you just sort of link them all together, and then you can uh, run run distributed jobs across them. Um, I actually happen to think um, that there's that might well be the future of forensics as we see large data sets. And I think um, when we do get our guest on next week, hopefully, um, although that will, may well go out before this does us, is the beautiful timelines of things. Um, you know, he- Show magic. Show magic, yeah. Um, he, he's going to talk about large data set forensics. And actually, I think there's a, that given the size and, and complexity of some of the cases we're starting to see, I think the only way we will be able to deal with it is to, introduce larger uh, processing clusters. I mean, nowadays you have a machine sitting on an examiner's desk and it's a big, I mean, it's a big piece of equipment, but it's a still a more or less a single machine. Yeah, I think, you know, we'll see um, distributed networks of machines coming in to play more. Well, I think uh, it's, it's even funded. similar to stuff like, um, again, I don't know where it's coming out in respect to this episode, but um, with Mackenzie from Geek Guardian, like mm. they're likely running uh, a cluster of computers to process through the data in yeah. AWS or Azure or wherever it is, but they're probably just like different EC2 instances of the machines running the same code to crunch through the data and then centralizing the, I guess, the metadata or the analysis of that to yeah. some central point to, to review. Um, and I mean, even, I'm not sure whether we've spoken to anyone about it, but even the forensics companies that are offering the cloud-based solutions at the moment, like they would be doing that in the back end for sure. Um, well, this will be, this will be interesting when we, um, when we get the guest on to, uh, we will, we will be having a conversation with somebody from Celebrite, um, mm-hmm. with regard to their cloud, uh, solution called Guardian, uh, at some point in the future, hopefully, um, and it'll be interesting to see what what sort of um, consolidation they have um, yeah, from sure. from endpoints. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, no, it's, I, I think it's a cloud cloud or distributed computing and cloud um, or private cloud is 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 another thing, isn't it? Because it's um, depending upon what the content of your analysis may may yeah. or may not contain. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think it's a very exciting field to be in and um we're gonna you know when you've been in the industry as long as i have you sort of see these things come and go is is we used to have centralized computers that everybody uh connected to um and then we had this we've we've gone out to distributed desktops and then we've got cloud which everybody connects to and we'll probably go through a phase of um some sort of distribute distribution again to to the end nodes and then so so you know we're coming back into this this consolidated phase at the moment and it'll be interesting to see where where forensics goes forward with that i think at the moment um 
there's a couple of a couple of people seem to be pushing that idea a bit more. Um, it's not N case. No, sorry, it's not FTK anymore. I forgot what they're called. Um, but they they are uh, they they're pushing it uh, a cloud yeah. cloud solution. Um, yeah, and I think like seeing from my experience, like when you review customers' networks and you see the vulnerabilities that they have, no matter what technology is, it's it's kind of foundational. Um, and every company, every country, sorry, calls it a different thing when they're reviewing it, but it, it's like the essential aid or the top four kind of things. And it all stems from the fact that we we never really do secure development in the life mm. cycle. So, that, so the yeah. only hope is like, like we need to in, embrace the technology that's coming out. You just hope that we've learned our lessons after decades of, of mistakes of making sure that the smart people who sit on both sides of the fence of security and usability in the mm. engineering space are, are doing as much as they can in the product. Um, and it, it could be hard because you could have a product that they don't think it, it blows up, but maybe it does. And heaps of people start using it. And then years later you find problems in the code because like there was never mitigating factors in place because secure, secure coding was, wasn't a thought 30 years ago. Or yeah. if it was, it was very narrow-minded because we've then jumped to, well, that code that was meant to run on an endpoint within an environment is now running on an internet-exposed device. Yeah. Um, I think I think another interesting aspect, and, and this sort of, again, we'll, we'll loop back neatly into what we were talking about earlier. Um, lots of people now don't develop code from scratch. And that's perfectly acceptable. Mm. We build on libraries that are yeah. uh, that are out there. But the trouble examples is... examples of those vulnerabilities yeah, in those yeah, libraries. In yeah. those libraries. Um, and also, you know, for things like Python in particular, there's been quite a lot of press regarding, uh, first of all, vulnerabilities in libraries just that exist because people are human and make mistakes and, and vulnerabilities exist. There have been examples of deliberately introduced vulnerabilities, well, compromises, uh, into libraries that sound remarkably like other libraries so that if you accidentally call the wrong library, you end up with malware. Um, and then um, the third category, which is is that actually people set code to auto-update. Mm. And somebody had a hissy fit, and I don't know enough about it to comment whether it was a reasonable hissy fit or not, but basically tanked their code. Um, and it oh. took out a whole bunch of people who were relying on it. Was that looping back into gaming? I think that was Final Fantasy fourteen with the G-Shader. Um, so third-party tools aren't allowed for that game. But, uh, yeah, the guy, like, tanked his code and essentially... Um, it was like, it was essentially ransomware, what the guy was doing, but it didn't, didn't really encrypt anything. It just like messed, messed up one of the Yeah, it just, it just stopped the code from working. Oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, it messed up a file. Uh, I'll put this in the show notes, but yeah, I, I was reading it. But yeah, essentially the, the dude had like a little bit of a, a hissy fit. Uh, yeah, I'll find a good, good write up for that story and include it in the show notes. Um. Yeah, that was interesting. And and that's that's another interesting point for like just general consumers. Like this was a free open source tool that people were using that, that wasn't harming the gameplay or anything. But you're relying on devs that like they're making pot potentially no money. Like if they decide, like you're trusting them to install something on your computer, if they in decide to install something malicious, like most of these programs run at administrator level that you allow. Um you're opening up. So like I, I don't do banking on my computer anymore. I only ever do it on my phone through the app. Like just cause I, I download a whole bunch of stuff for work through, through my computer um, or just like interesting things. Who knows what's actually running on it? Yeah. I'm going to say, and, and you know, it's not, it's not only the, um, Open source is a, is a, is a fascinating field, and, and you know we're, we're coming we're, we're slightly over the top of the hour, um, but it's a fascinating field and one that I have a huge amount of time and belief in, and uh, time for and belief in. Um, mm. But I seem to recall that I was just trying to find a link for it. But a few years back, 
um, NTP, so the Network Time Protocol, and and some of the N the NTPD uh, demons um, that basically the entire world relies on for um, making sure that time is synchronized across everything uh, it was like being maintained by one guy who. Um, who, who ended up? I'm going to try and find this link, and I, I'm, I hope I'm not talking rubbish because otherwise we're going to have to cut a lot out of this. I do vaguely um, remember the story, yeah. Um, but but essentially, this this guy was was running it on his own, maintaining the software on his own, and and when actually, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm retiring, or I'm not making any money out of this. I don't have time to do it, and everybody actually bricked themselves because, you know. <laughs> Um, I, I think there was a crowdfunding. Well, I hope there was a crowdfunding that gave him, you know, enough money to to retire comfortably and just maintain this for the rest of his natural life. Um, but again, you know, it's terrifying that such a critical single piece of software is just being maintained by one person. Who, uh, you know, if he falls under a bus, it's, you know, we're we're screwed. I mean, above yeah. anything else, he'll take the bloody keys to the repository with him. <laughs> and we'll have to get Git Guardian in to scrape them out, you know. <laughs> They've already um, got them. It's all good. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so, um, so if yeah. this episode comes out before that episode, that, that'll be super confusing to all the listeners. But just wait <laughs> for the Git Guardian episode. Then, then, you'll, then you'll get the joke. Yeah, yeah, you'll listen and you'll be like, oh, I can laugh along with Sign Desi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Right, I think I think we probably better call it a day. I think so. I'm um, seeing as uh, we've been blathering long enough, and uh, and Jamie will be having a fit. So, uh... <laughs> I mean, look, if he if he wants to throw a fit, more than welcome to come on the show and and throw a fit and and have something. <laughs> Until all that happens, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We we don't want to hear anything in the, the answer that there is. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, cool. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Um, okay. You take care until we speak again. We will um, be chatting with some more guests soon. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, a huge amount of links will be going into the show notes for this one because we've had some fun. Mm -hmm. um, Forensic Focus Forums are there for your delectation and enjoyment as our past uh, back issues of uh, the podcast, which you can also find on Spotify uh, Apple Podcasts. I don't even yep. know what it's called. Yeah, Apple Google. Podcasts, Google, Google, YouTube, YouTube. Um, yeah, we're everywhere. You can't get away from us. Um, we're working up to our Netflix show. We'll get there. <laughs> um, Only and, if they're going to fly uh, us somewhere. That'll be interesting. Ooh, forensics. We'll, 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 we'll make good alliteration with forensics. I don't know. I feel like we should do a Who Done It murder mystery, but with digital forensics. I'm vaguely contemplating writing one at some point, you know. There we go. You write it, we'll pitch it, we'll be on a Netflix. That's show. it, that's it. it but it, the, the only trouble is, is that it won't be as exciting as um, uh, CSI Cyber because it'll actually have to be based in reality if I'm writing it. So um, we'll go from I'm there. Sure, anyway. I'm sure you can fit in a scene where there's like you programming on the on the keyboard and then you're like, I need some help and I come in on the same keyboard. Oh, it stands across. Because <laughs> you you can like do forensics faster that way with two people on one keyboard. That's it. Absolutely, that's the way it works. And sort this cloud computing and distributed stuff. No, it's just two people on the same keyboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, mate. You take care. And, you too. Uh, I'll talk Catch to you everyone. Soon. Uh, cheers. Bye.